things happen that bring you back to, to our remembrance. Um, and the enemy is at work trying to bring complacency, um, spiritual slumber, um, and trying to bring error. So it's our job um, to make sure that that does not happen. Um, let us go. Father, in the name of Jesus, I give you praise and worship and I adore you. I commit myself and pressure to your hand. I ask for your anointing and your grace. Speak to the name of the Spirit. Take control. Speak to our hearts that which we want to follow In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Today is not going to be fire and brimstone kind of preaching or whatever. I'll just share some things with us as family, as friends, as brothers and sisters. Um, so we just take it as it goes. But through that, I really wanted to open your hearts to what God will say to you. Let me start by saying that we live in, um, in very interesting times in the church age. I don't know which day, which hour Jesus will come, but it's getting closer and closer. And um, you might be in our generation, you might not be, I don't know. But it is possible that it is in our generation. And what's happening is that there are all sorts of things that are trying to strangulate the faith of Christians to make us to not be aware. To make us to be caught on our ways, to make us to be distracted, to make us to chase after other things, to the pursuit of God, to make us to not be on fire for God. And today I just want us to talk a bit about this and share this. And my intention is that you will leave this place today <coughs> determined more than ever before to hold on to Christ. Determined more than ever before to refuse to be distracted. Determined more than ever before to plan for the future. Because remember again, we don't know the day, we don't know the hour. It could be not in our generation, so you want to plan. But at the same time, to live ready day. To not go from one extreme to the other. Alright? So I've titled this particular session... I've titled it The Prophet Who Cried Wolf. <laughs> the Prophet Who Cried Wolf. Now, for some of you that went to, to, to nursery schools, um, you probably know the story of the boy who cried wolf. Some of us went to uh, we were in primary school <laughs> and uh, we didn't have the opportunity of uh, that some of you had that went to Bosch nursery school and you had all this. Oh, I heard this story later. My, my friends told me. And the story of the boy who cried the wolf goes something like this. There once was a shepherd boy who was born as he sat on the hillside watching the village sleep, I mean, the village sheep. To amuse himself, he took a great breath and sang out, Wolf! Wolf! The wolf is chasing the sheep, he cried. The villagers come running up the hill to help the boy drive the wolf away. But when they arrived at the top of the hill, they found no wolf. So the boy laughed at the sight of their angry faces. Don't cry wolf, shepherd boy, said the villagers. When there's no wolf, so they went crumbling back down the hill. Later, the boy sank out again. Woof! Woof! The wolf is chasing the ship. So it's not in the light to watch the villagers run up the hill to help them drive the wolf away. When the villagers saw no wolf, they sternly said, Save your fighting song for when there really is something wrong. Don't cry wolf when there is no wolf. But the boy just cling and watch them go grumbling down the hill once more. You could see that the boy was enjoying this whole spectacle. Later, he saw a real wolf <laughs> prowling about his flock. Aloud, he leaped to his feet and sang out as loudly as he could. Wolf! Wolf! Well, you can imagine what happened. But what did not happen? So the villagers thought he was trying
trying to fool them again. So they didn't come. At sunset, everybody wondered why the shepherd boy hadn't returned to the village with their sheep. They went up the hill to find the boy. They found him weeping. There really was a wolf here this time. The flock has scattered. I cried out, wolf, why didn't you come? So an old man tried to comfort the boy as they walked down to the village. So the old man said to the boy, we we'll help you look for the lost sheep in the morning. He said, putting his arm around the youth. Nobody believes a lie, even when he's telling the truth, said the old man. Nobody believes a liar, even when he's telling the truth. No, <laughs> some people will not believe the church, even when they are now telling the truth. Because some people have gone out and have prophesied lies. Some people have gone to say Jesus is coming on this particular day and he did not come. And then they've changed the date. I understand the person that gave the date September 24 has now given the date October or something. <laughs> and because they do that, they cry wolf, when really there is no wolf. And what that does is that by the time the wolf really comes, they have built a reputation for insincerity. They have built a reputation for lying. They have built a reputation for doing what they can to sell books and for money. To the point where the world now says, forget it, it's a lie. No wonder the Bible tells us in the book of Second Peter that they have been saying, where is the sign of his coming? Since the days of our forefathers, forget it, there is no Jesus coming. Jesus said that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man shall come. As it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be when the Son of Man shall come. And we're going to look at that in a minute. But in those days, just to give a, a, a summary of that, things carried on as normal. You understand? Things just carried on as normal. And then they came. The fact that some people have cried wolf when they shouldn't have should not stop you from being expectant. The fact that some people have cried wolf when they shouldn't have should not stop you from being prepared. Be prepared, be ready, daily, but plan like it could be a thousand years. Now here is the balance. The Bible says that a day is like a thousand years in the eyes of God and a thousand years like a day. So which means what might look like a day in our eyes might actually be a thousand years. What might look like a thousand years in our eyes might come suddenly. So the whole idea is to be ready. To be ready and to be prepared. Daily, whilst planning for the future. The problem with Christians sometimes is they find it difficult to just hold the line. Some Christians just go from one extreme, and then when you correct them from that extreme, they don't stay in the middle, they go all the way to the other extreme. It's a bit like Peter. Jesus said, let me wash my feet. Peter said, uh -uh. What's the abomination? The whole Jesus wash my feet. That's not going to happen. So Jesus explained to Peter why he needed to wash his feet. When he got the revelation, he went from that's not going to happen to wash my whole body, not just my feet. Just, no, 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 no. Just your feet. Let's stay in the middle. Can I still wash your feet now? So I can teach this principle. And many Christians are like that. We go from one extreme to the other. We don't know the day of the hour. But that doesn't mean that we stop everything. It doesn't mean that we stop planning. It doesn't mean that we don't plan for the future. Because it could take a hundred years. It could take a thousand years. I doubt it personally, but let's just go with scriptures. But then, we should be ready daily. So don't let the prophets who cry wolf make you to become sleepy, make you to become unprepared, Make you to be not ready. The prophets who cried wolf. Prepare, don't despair. Prepare, do not despair. Jesus made it clear to us that look, there must be no shape. Everybody say no shape. No you know, when you hear that phrase, you think some Nigerians coined it. It's actually in the Bible. It's very difficult. Look at 
Look at Second Thessalonians chapter two. You see no shame in there. I'll show it to you. Second Thessalonians chapter two. I'm reading from the New King James Version, so if you have some of the funkier versions, it might say a different word. Um, starting from verse 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 2, I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 from verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word, or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. So it's that first bit that says, not to be soon shaken. Don't be shaken in your mind. As long as you're walking right with God, there's no shaking. There's no, you don't need to fret. You need to be of good cheer. You need to stay hopeful. You need to remain at peace. Jesus himself said to us, when you see these signs beginning to happen, look up. Because your redemption draws near. Rejoice. There is no shame. The Bible says that we need to understand the times that we live in. We should be like the sons of Isaac, who understood the times and what Israel ought to do. So you see that I think in First Chronicles. Let's have a quick look on that in a second. I think it's First Chronicles three twenty. No, First Chronicles twelve thirty two. First Chronicles twelve thirty two. Just put it on the screen very quickly. First Chronicles twelve thirty two. Chronicles is after after Kings. Now, First Chronicles twelve thirty two. Uh, actually, looking at it from say verse thirty one. Now, of the half tribe of Menasseh, 18,000 who are des designated by name to come and make David king. And then verse 32 says, of the sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Two things, they had understanding of the times. Secondly, they knew what Israel ought to do. You need to understand the times that we live in. Talk to your neighbor. Do you know the time? <laughs> you need to understand the time that we live in. <laughs> nice one, David. She went like that. <laughs> you need to understand the time that we live in. But the purpose of knowing the time is so that you know what we ought to do. You understand? So, for example, when you wake up in the morning, I don't know what the first thing that you do is, but hopefully you look at the time and then if you're, you know, the early morning prayer person. When it's time for prayer, you get up and you pray. When it's time for dinner, you go get dinner. When it's time to go to school, you go to school. When it's time to go to work, you go to work and so on and so forth. And when it's time to come to church, you come to church on time. <laughs> for they, they, they needed to know what time it is and what Israel wants to do. By knowing the time that we live in, it gives us instruction comes from it. You get instruction from knowing the time. You get direction from knowing the time. You get wisdom from knowing the time. You understand this? So, and knowing the time is so that we know what to do. Some say that when you look at prophetic, the prophetic clock of God, that Israel is the, the, the our hand, the short one. That when that our hand begins to move close to 12, and when it hits 12, then you know the time is over. And that Israel is that our hand. That watch the events that go on in Jerusalem. Check it with scriptures. Then you'll be able to track God's timing. You understand? And when you look at Israel, for example, I mean, 
there was a prophecy that a nation was going to be born in a day. For hundreds of years, it looked impossible. There was no sign that it was going to happen. And then in 1948, in one day, I think in March, in the month of March, bang, the nation of Israel was, quote unquote, created. But it wasn't created in the realm of the spirit it had been. God has scattered the people to the different parts of the world for centuries. And then God said that he will begin to gather them from all the parts of the world back to Jerusalem. And the ingathering started and is continuing. And Israel is now a thriving nation. He said that in the desert that there will be fruitfulness. And now Israel, that is a desert like all the other nations around it, is a net exporter of agricultural goods. They have more than enough that they grow in the desert, and so on and so forth. I understand that some people are already preparing, for example, for the, the, the third temple that the Antichrist has prophesied in the book of Daniel was coming to reign over. So when you begin to study all these events, not to talk about so many other things that Jesus spoke about, wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes in diverse places, in fact, by the time you go to the book of Timothy and it begins to talk about the state of man in the last days and you look at what's going on, not just in this nation, but in the nations across the world, it's, there's no doubt that we are far moved. So some say that the, the, the big hand, the minute hand, is very, very close to 12. We don't know the time, we don't, I mean, we don't know the day, we don't know the hour, but we are meant to be able to understand the time. So, do not allow some false prophets to get you to the point where you write everything off. We need to still be prepared and we need to be ready. But be of good shape, stay hopeful, remain at peace, look up for your redemption, trust in. There shall be no shaking. Now, Jesus also told us that one of the ways by which we we'll know the time, he said, as it was in the days of Noah. So shall it be when the Son of Man shall come. As it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be when the Son of Man shall come. So when you want to know when the Son of Man shall come, then know how it was in the days of Noah. When you want to know how it will be when the Son of Man shall come, know how it was in the days of Lot. So let's start with Lot. Luke chapter 17, verse 28 to 30. So just, you know, just looking at scriptures and seeing what the Bible says. Um, and then we'll come and finish up with what we ought to do. Luke 17, 28. Then Peter said, I don't know, is that the right one? No, that's not the right one. 17, 28. Okay. Let's back up to... Let's back up to verse 22 to get a context. Luke 17, 22. Then he said to his disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in these days like lightning. Like lightning. I love lightning. There's something fascinating about lightning. I remember a time when my little girl was even more little and, um, and she would go and sit by, by the garden door and, at night and when there's lightning and I remember this particular night she sat down and I sat down next to her and we were just admiring the lightning that was flashing in the sky and I still, I still had that picture. But lightning is quick. Lightning is very, very quick. And it says as lightning that flashes out from under him would socially be Verse 25. But first you must suffer many things. 26. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. This is Jesus speaking. Now look at verse 27. How was it in the days of Noah? So we'll start with that one. Verse 27. Let's read it together. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until. Stop. They ate, they drank, they married wives, and they were given in marriage until. What is wrong with eating? 
What's wrong with drinking? Not as in being drunk in alcohol. What's wrong, what's wrong with getting married? Okay, some of you don't answer that question. <laughs> and they were given in marriage. But the point is, life continued as normal. Do you understand? Life just continued as normal. That was the point. Until, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And then the flood came and destroyed them all. It took Noah almost 100 years to finish building that ark. While he was building the ark, the Bible said that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He kept warning them. But nothing happened in year one. Nothing happened in year 15. Nothing happened in year 27. Nothing happened 37 years later, 40, 50, 60 years later. And they got tired of his crying wolf. And he was a preacher of righteousness and he kept preaching it. So they continued with life. It just continued. Until the day that Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and then destroyed them all. Verse 28, likewise as it was also in the days of Lot. Look at that again. Let's read it together. What did they do? They ate, they drank, they bought, they sowed, they planted, they built. What's wrong with that? Are we meant to be eating? Of course, you don't eat after a while, you die. They drank, they did business. Should we be doing business? Oh, yes. Buy, sell, build, do it. Prosper. They planted, they built. Life carried on. Verse 29. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Verse 30. Even so. Everybody say, even so. Even so. These are the sort of things you should underline if you still carry a book Bible. Even so, will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed? That's exactly how it's going to be. Which means life will go on as normal. And then, bam, he comes. And then he says a few things. In that day, he was on the house tour, you know, um, and his goods are in the house. Forget about your goods. Just, you know, <laughs> go for it. And then in verse 32, he talks about remember Lord's wife. And then also in 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2, we read from verse 3 to verse 7. The best way to, to check the Bible is to use the Bible to check the Bible. So 2 Peter chapter 2 from verse 3. Sorry, um, yeah, chapter 2 from verse 3. But for, by covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. Again, that's talking about the false prophets. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. That's for me. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned and cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah. Everybody say, saved Noah. Saved Noah. The same way God saved Noah, God will save you. <coughs> All you need to do is to stand in righteousness. God's hand is not short to save. Don't try to work out your own salvation in this, when it comes to this. Rather, put your trust in God. Put your trust in God. So, he said Nora, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. So all you need to do is to make sure that you are not part of the world of the ungodly. Don't be put with them. Verse 6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, it condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. So what happened in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah is an example unto us. 
that we ought to live godly and not ungodly. But look at verse 7. He delivered righteous lot. So Noah was called righteous, the preacher of righteousness. Lot was called righteous. Noah was delivered. Lot was delivered. You will be delivered. Amen. Because you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Stay in that righteousness. And God will deliver you. Amen. And it says in verse 8, For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless things. Let me explain. So, Lot was in Sodom, Lot was in Gomorrah. He saw the unrighteousness and the lawlessness, but it was a torment for his soul. Why? Because he chose not to be part of them. He was in them, but not part of them. So that creates conflict, internal turmoil. The government began to make laws that the thing that the Bible says is ungodly, the government is trying to make law. And then the government is trying to turn on those who are against what the Bible says is ungodly and to turn them to criminals. And even trying to force them to do that which is ungodly. That tormented his soul. That should torment your soul. My brothers and sisters, we live in those days now. I don't know whether you read the news or whether you mix with people. Amazing things are happening that are so unbiblical, it is unbelievable. But it's not just that they are unbiblical, it is that they are now being made into law. And you think, excuse me, even if you forget the Bible, is this even normal? Does this make sense? I mean, I don't need to go into examples. We thought it was same sex that was the issue. They've moved on to, I had another one recently, something binary, binary, gender binaries. Come on, you read these things. We are young people. Young people are not even old. Are saying that they are gender binary neutral. Yes. Yes. Is that the phrase? Yes. So they are neither male nor female. Uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the Bible said male and female. God made them. Who changed the rules? Where did that one come from? Do you understand what I'm saying? We live in that age now. I was driving to work. I was listening to a debate on radio. And this young man came and he was talking, he said, I'm a conservative, I'm a do -do 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 -do. And the interviewer was intrigued. He said, oh, tell me a bit about yourself. Oh, he said, you know, most of my the people I hang out with, my generation, we are gender, neutral, binary. I had to go and check it out. Because the people I know don't talk like that. I said, what is this one? So I found out that they are declaring that gender is not, is not relevant and you should choose to be gender neutral. Where is that going? So a man can act like a woman, a woman can act like a man, a man can do whatever with anybody because you see, it's not about man or woman anymore. So the moment you take that out of the equation, where is it immoral? So you redefine the foundation and the basis of morality. You wipe it all off and you rewrite the rules. And that's the age we, 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 we believe in. We're living in an age where some people are pushing, pushing, pushing for sex between an adult and a child to be made legal. We call it pedo, pedo, pedophilia at the moment. I pray that this will not be the sort of prophecy that comes true. But people are pushing to make it into law. In certain countries, it is legal, it is okay for a human being to have I know there are younger people here, but to mate with an animal, it is by law okay. Are you listening to me? Now, are you shocked by these things? Because you ought to. Don't be so used to those things that your level of sensitivity has been, has been dulled. Don't. Stay sharp. Do you understand what I'm saying? Stay sharp in the spirit. Call white, white. Call black, black. Don't go into all those gray areas. It's a slippery slope. It's a slippery slope. Now, when you begin to think like that, does it bother you? Does it, is it any wonder that such a person will now come and say, I don't believe in God? How can they believe in God? Because the God of the Bible goes against all these things and makes it clear in black and white. 
And that exactly was the state in those days. That's what was happening. That's what was happening. Now, which picture are we looking at? Second Peter chapter 2. And verse 7. And delivered righteous Lord, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct. Did you see that? He was their filthy conduct oppressed him. Sometimes I feel like Jeremiah. So I pray to God, I say, don't make me like Jeremiah. He was known as the wicked prophet. And I'm saying, Lord, what is going on? But then sometimes I look around and it looks like I'm being over spiritual. I I'm telling you the truth. Sometimes I just feel like that. Now I can understand how Lord it, it oppressed him. Those thoughts bothered him. Because he was almost a loner thinking like that. Which was why when it came to the time of being delivered, only he and his household were delivered. When it came to the time of Noah being delivered, only him and his household of a total of eight people were delivered. Can you imagine how many people were in the land? So it is not about going with what is seen as politically correct. Don't be so educated that you educate God out of your thinking. Don't do it. Especially young people, I beg you, do not do it. Don't do it. It's a slippery slope. Hang on to God. We live in a day and age where the assault is not by a physical devil that you can see that has horns and tail. The assault is on the thoughts, the values, the basics of what makes us beings. That's where the assault is. It's internal. Amen. The assault is on the heart. It's on what you hold in your heart. The combination of the thoughts, the ideas, the values, the belief system that you carry here. Sometimes when our children go to school, even the so-called religious education has changed. Some of it is now beginning to attack Christianity. Am I, am, I, am, I, am I talking right, guys? And if you don't know the word of God, you could let your child go to religious education and they educate faith out of them. And they have to stand their faith. I remember when my child was in, what was doing, was it religious education? In, in A levels or something like that. And a vicar, complete with color, <laughs> was invited to come and speak to them about it. It was the children in the class that stood up and said, and you call yourself a man of God, shame on you. <laughs> because he was going against the word of God. Just because he wears a color does not mean it's right. Do you understand what I'm saying? You've got to stand for the truth. And the world loves backsliding Christians. The world loves Christians and even those who call themselves preachers who don't hold on to the truth of the word of God. The world loves them. They, those are the ones they will position and lift up as an example of a correct Christian. You see, because that one does not criticize, it does not judge. You see, it's love. Let's just love one another. Let's just love, love. Yes. And this love is universal, isn't it? Yes. You know, man, woman, woman, man, 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 woman, woman is love. Who defines love? You can't tell who you fall in love. What nonsense. Are you hearing me? Am I grieved in my spirit because the judge is sleeping and allow rubbish yes. and I'm not standing for the truth of the word of God? During my watch, in your church, in your family, you can make a difference. In your home, start with that. You can make a difference. You can choose and you should choose to stand on the undiluted, uncompromised word of God. Be like Lot. Be like Noah. Refuse to be carried away 
with the wind of every doctrine. Because there is deception, the spirit of deception that the enemy has sent through the land. Look at uh, 2 Timothy. <coughs> okay, let's start with 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Look at this. Now, the Spirit expressly, everybody say expressly. Expressly. Expressly means explicitly, clearly, without any doubt. The Holy Spirit says that in the latter times, and we're in those times, some will depart from the faith. That's not a prophecy that has your name against it. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? The fact that this one is in the Bible is not, does not mean you, this is the one you, you shouldn't let happen to you. Some will depart from the faith. You cannot depart from something you are not in. Some say, well, they really were not in. They didn't really believe. No, that's not what the Bible said. It said they were in the faith. And then they departed from the faith. We've got to wake up to this. It does not happen overnight. It does not happen overnight. It starts by having reasons not to be in fellowship. It starts by having reasons not to pray. It starts by having reasons not to read the Bible. It starts by having reasons to be so busy. It starts by eating, drinking, marrying, getting married, and not doing the things of God. Nothing wrong with that, but not focusing on God. It starts by not getting our priorities right. Today, the only sense of this message is to rearrange and reorder your life around Jesus, around the Word of God, around God. Do you understand? Let your priorities be rearranged with God at the center of it. If the enemy comes and he knows the buttons that he can press in each of us, he knows. He knows what can drive, what can pull you away. He knows. For some people, it's women. For some, it's men. I was going to say for some men, it's women. But nowadays, it could be. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> but you understand what I'm saying? For some, it's power, influence, wanting to build an empire. For some, it's quote and unquote success. Listen to me. Success is good. God has purposed us for victory and for success. But success must be defined by God, not by the eyes of the world. Success, your success, how you measure your success must be based on what the Word of God says. For some, it's ego. The moment you do something, their ego is rubbed the wrong way. Oh my goodness, and will they come down on you? For some, it's their emotions. Their spirit is like an open door. There is no control over their emotions. They get upset easily about everything and they get angry. Oh, and anger is a spirit. And when it takes hold, people begin to behave in a way that is absolutely abnormal. But you're going to find out what yours is. One of the things I do is I come to my wife and say, Man, some people really mess me up today. I really, really have to be. I need God to help me to not act in the flesh. We still have that discussion this morning. God says, confess your faults one to another so that you might be healed. Do you understand what I'm saying? You've got to know the one that is yours. No reason to dare to dwell and to, to live according to the flesh. You need to have accountabilities. People that can speak to your life. People you are accountable to. Do you understand what I'm saying? Watch the company that you keep. Bad communication corrupts good manners. The word communication there is talking about association. Who do you associate with? Who are the people in your inner circle? What values do they hold? 
Are they on fire for God? Are you following me so far? Yes. You've got to live a life where you've got Jesus right at the center of everything. We sing that song. At the center of it all. It's you that are I see. It's not, it's not just a song. It's a life. It's a life. When you're coming to church, during worship, don't lie. <laughs> when you say, I surrender all, don't lie. If you know at that time you are struggling to surrender with some things, stop the song for a minute. Don't worry, everybody else is looking forward, they won't see you. <laughs> and ask God, this area I'm struggling to surrender it. Help me. By will, I surrender it. Now go back and join the song. Live like a Christian. Live from the inside out, not from the out in. Are you following me? Live from the spirit of God that is on the inside of you out. Live by the word. Jesus says, when the Son of Man shall come, will you find faith on earth? Build your spirit man. Build it with prayer. Build it with the word of God. Build it with worship. When you don't do that and you feed it with other stuff, don't be surprised that you are having thoughts that are against the word of God. What comes out is dependent on what goes in. Feed your spirit. Feed your soul. When you are born again, it's your spirit that is born again. But your soul goes through a process. Allow that process to take place. Don't get so easily offended. Don't fret. Don't worry. For some people, that all you just need to have to, to hear is the word. Don't worry. I've got it covered. So he says the some will in, 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 in the latter days, latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, taking lies in hypocrisy. Lies. I have to be telling some people I don't tell lies. Somebody came to me and said, Go, oh, what you did on this particular day, you put a stone. I said to them, No. When I told you this was the situation, why I did not make that meeting, it is the truth. I do not tell lies. I don't tell lies. I have to reflect on the fact that I have to be telling that person that I don't tell lies. <laughs> It should be a natural thing that as Christians we don't tell lies. But is it natural? Ask your neighbor, is it natural with you? <laughs> don't tell lies. Don't tell lies. It's simple. God says he hates liars. But he wants to love you. Don't tell lies. It says, giving heed to the sinning spirits. You see, the sinning spirits, spirits of deception, they don't just come and get in. If there is a lying spirit on the inside, it will attract a deceiving spirit. And the one that is lying now becomes deceived and begins to deceive other people. Don't walk in darkness, cloaks, shaking, hiding everything. Having their conscience seared with hot iron. And then verse 6. If you instruct the brethren in these things, which I'm doing, as we begin to close, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith, of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. Find a good doctrine. Carefully follow it. Somebody wants to steal that doctrine from your heart. Amen? Amen. When the Son of Man shall come, will he find faith on earth? Watch the company that you keep. Hang out with those who are on fire for God. Be distant from sinners. Plan for the future. You don't know the date, you don't know the hour, but plan for the future. It's like an exam. You're trying your best, you do the best. But when the examiner says, bends up, bends up. When Jesus comes and he says, time up, time up. 
But until he says so, we walk, we serve, we walk by faith, we walk in righteousness, we walk in truth. Keep winning souls. Keep looking for opportunity to witness to somebody. Keep pursuing destiny. Keep up with the assignment that God has for you. Stay busy. How do you want God to find you? How do you want Jesus to, to find you when he comes? Let him find you busy in his house. Busy doing the things of God. Your heart doing the things of God. Have a long-term godly plan. Plan, but make it a godly one. Prepare the next generation. Pass the touch on. Raise your children in the house of God, in the word of God, in the things of God. Stay focused. Stay focused. Live ready. Live with a sense of urgency to your assignment. Sometimes when I introduce myself, and uh, when I'm teaching elsewhere, or if I'm talking to Bible school students for the first time, I, and now I introduce myself in terms of assignment. I am a child of God. That's one. I am a husband to one wife. <laughs> That's two. It's an assignment. I am a father to four children. It's a God-given assignment to which I will give account. Are you with me? I am a pastor. It is a God-given assignment to which I will give account. I am a teacher of the word of God. It is a call of God and I will teach people in truth. I am in my official role at work. You all know what that one is. It is a call. So each one of them is an assignment. Any other assignment that someone is trying to throw onto my plate, if I check it and it's not a God-given assignment, I push it out. If you do not focus on God's agenda for you, you will end up running somebody else's agenda. What's God's agenda for you? What's your assignment? How faithful? How faithfully are you pursuing it? What will make you to throw it all over and walk away from it? Then what happens when Jesus comes? What account would you give? So I close with this one. What's your assignment? What's your agenda? How are you following it through? What are you going to do about it? If by chance you walk away from it because you know life happens, all sorts of pressures, it's never too late. Go right back to the center of it. Go right back to the center of it. When some of the pressure comes and I see other agendas trying to squeeze me in a certain direction, I begin to moan to my wife, may God bless her. <laughs> I just begin to moan. So I get it out of the way. I clear my head. Then I get back on track. What's your agenda? Have somebody you are accountable to. Don't be so secretive and private about your own life. It's my life. Nobody should know about my life. Eh? The devil knows who. And he will operate in darkness. He loves darkness. He's the prince of darkness. Don't walk in darkness. Walk in the light. In the light, everything is made plain. When Jesus comes, you will find faith in your life. When Jesus comes, he will find you being busy doing the work of God. The enemy will not be able to save you. Jesus said to Peter, the enemy has planned to save you. But I have prayed for you that your faith will hold. I pray for you that your faith will hold. In every area that the enemy tries to save you, I come against that spirit in the name of Jesus. I bind you. I command you to lose your hold over the people. Every godly assignment that God has for his people in this place. I call it to manifestation. In the name of Jesus. Every spirit of destruction. I want to take you away from the pursuit of God's plan. I come against such spirits. I bind you. I rebuke you. You will not have your way in the lives of this people. In the name of Jesus. You will fulfill God's plans. You will prosper. You will live in health. 
You will declare the glory of the Lord. You will walk in righteousness. God's work will prosper in your hands. When Jesus comes, you will be able to give a good account of how you lived your life. It is well with you. It is well with you. You are divinely protected from deception. Wrong doctrine shall not be your portion. In the name of Jesus, God will give you a sensitivity in your spirit. I pray for the gift of discernment of spirits that you will know by what spirits things are operating. It will be well with you. It shall be well with you. In the name of Jesus, every opposition that comes your way, in the mighty name of Jesus, they shall fall for your sake. Amen. They shall come seven ways, they shall, they shall come one way, they shall scatter seven ways Amen. with terror. In the name of Jesus, Amen. your heart will be on fire for God. Amen. You will prosper. Amen. You will do it. Amen. In the name of Jesus, Amen. it shall be well with you. Amen. Say unto the righteous, it is well with them. It is well with you. Amen. It is well with your household. Amen. It is well with your husband. Amen. It is well with your wife. It is well with your children. It is well with your health. It is well with your mind. It is well with you. It is well with your education. In the name of Jesus. Whatsoever you shall lay your hands upon shall prosper. In the name of Jesus. We thank God for your life. Lord, we give you praise. We worship you. Come, Lord Jesus. But before then, use us to do your work. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.